Hello and good evening. Tonight's webinar will be hosted by Pavel Surda, rhinology consultant at Guy's Hospital in London, and myself, Venki Torstensen, um, rhinology consultant and professor at Trondheim University Hospital in Norway. On behalf of the organizing committee and the ERS, I'm happy to welcome you to the ERS webinar series with a great team of panelists. We would like to thank Olympus as a main sponsor. And this evening we will be talking about the pioneering role of probiotics in managing chronic rhinosinusitis, discussing both foundational research and novel clinical applications. With insight from leading experts, the session aims to enhance understanding of the cyanonasal microbiome's potential and its th therapeutic implications in CRS. It is a real pleasure this evening to welcome two colleagues, all with extensive experience. We have Kathleen Martins from Belgium and rhinologist Anders Mortensen from Sweden. For those who cannot join this live session, the webinar will be uploaded uh, to the ERS uh, YouTube channel and it will be available to view at your own pace. Lastly, at the end, there will be a Q&A session where we can answer questions, so don't hesitate to type your questions in the chat function. We will be viewing them and at the end we will have a look at them with our experts from the field. Without further ado, I will pass over to Kathleen Martins. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the KU Leuven, focusing on the interaction between the microbiome and the nasal epithelial barrier function in the upper airway. Please, Kathleen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction and also for giving me the opportunity to present today. And as you already mentioned, um, the topic of my talk is uh, probiotics in sinonasal disease, and I will mainly focus on uh, fundamental uh, research. Um, just go to the next slide. Yes, so this is um, my disclosure. I have uh, no conflict of interest uh, to report. Um, here you see an overview of the content of my talk. I will start off with a brief introduction about chronic upper airway diseases, and then I will talk about the nasal epithelial barrier and microbiome. In the third section, I will um, discuss what is needed to identify probiotics as a potential treatment option, and I will end my talk uh, discussing some clinical applications. So as we all know, um, chronic upper airway diseases, um, typically you, um, you see them as, or define them as a allergic rhinitis or chronic rhinosinusitis. And these are both disorders of uh, the upper respiratory tract. When you look at allergic rhinitis, um, this is characterized by mucosal inflammation of the nasal cavity, which leads to symptoms such as nasal blockage, nasal discharge, sneezing, and nasal itch. The current treatment options are avoidance of allergens and or triggering factors, antihistamines, corticosteroids, and allergen immunotherapy. Chronic rhinosinusitis, or CRS, is caused by mucosal inflammation of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses, which leads to nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, loss of smell, and facial pain. The current treatment options are nasal irrigation, topical or oral steroids, antibiotics, biologicals, and as a last option, a functional endoscopic sinus surgery. And hopefully in the near future, we can also add probiotics. When we look at the endotypes of uh, both disorders, we do see some similarities. So both of them can have an underlying type one or type two immune response. We also have a neurogenic component. And then lastly, which is the main focus of my work is involvement of the epithelial barrier. All these four components can be influenced by the environment, our lifestyle, the nasal anatomy, and also the microbiome. The microbiome is the collection of microorganisms in the human body that live in and on different human body sites. It plays a very important role in our daily health because it is able to exclude or inhibit pathogens, it is also capable of maintaining the epithelial barrier integrity and mo modulating the local and systemic host immune response. 
However, studies have reported shifts in microbiome composition in allergic rhinitis and chronic rhinosinusitis. With an increase in pathogenic bacteria, such as Staphylococcus aureus, and a decrease in beneficial bacteria, such as the Lactobaciliaca species. So, as I mentioned, the microbiome plays an important role in maintaining an intact epithelial barrier. And this interplay is quite interesting because the nasal epithelium forms the first line of defense against encountered microorganisms. And to do so, it is built up by different uh, cell types that all expressed uh, various receptors. So if you look at uh, the figure here, you can see that the epithelium is built up by ciliated epithelial cells, basal cells, tuft cells, and goblet cells. And these express different receptors, such as the taste receptors and the patent recognition receptors. And these are then able to recognize microorganisms and induce a proper immune response against them. However, in allergic rhinitis and CRS, a disturbed nasal epithelial barrier function has been reported as a result of a decreased expression of um, the intracellular junctions, such as the tight junctions, making the epithelium more leaky towards pathogens and allergens. Other studies have also reported changes in the expression of these different receptors. So that's why we ask ourselves the question, can the epithelial barrier be restored and how can we do this? And a potential new treatment option to restore the epithelial barrier are probiotics. Probiotics are live microorganisms that, when applied in adequate amounts, confirm a health benefit to the host. And indeed, during the, the last uh, decade, a lot of studies have been performed to evaluate the effect or the efficacy of probiotics in upper airway diseases. But when uh, you want to identify a novel probioticum, it is actually very interesting to select a bacteria of which, we, of which you know that is present in the niche of interest. So since we focus on the upper airways, it is of utmost importance to select one of which we know that is present in the, uh, in the upper respiratory tract. And to do so, it is good to perform microbiome profiling studies where you as such document the microbiome. And therefore, uh, we conducted a comparison study where we uh, collected uh, nasal swabs from different niches in the nose of healthy individuals and compared it to uh, the microbiome in CRS patients. So from these nasal swabs, we isolated bacterial DNA and performed uh, Illumina MySix sequencing. And we could see that uh, the abundance of the Carnobacteriaceae and the Lactobaciliaceae was higher in healthy controls compared to CRS patients. And these bacteria are often seen as beneficial ones. So in the next phase, uh, we delved deeper into these uh, different species and tried to characterize them. And my colleague, Ilke de Boek, was able to identify a Dolocyranum pigrum, which showed higher, um, both on DNA level and uh, abundance, that was higher in controls compared to CRS patients. She also looked at the Lactobaciliaceae, and there she was able to isolate nine species that showed higher abundancy in healthy controls versus disease. So thanks to these um, uh, microbiome profiling, we are able to identify uh, interesting uh, common cell bacteria that maybe have uh, beneficial effects. So to be able to identify them as probiotics, it is, of course, important uh, to evaluate if they harbor probiotic characteristics. And what are these characteristics? Well, first of all, they need to be able to interact with other microbes. And like I mentioned during my uh, introduction, they need to be able to inhibit and compete with them. They should also be able to uh, modulate the epithelial barrier to protect them or to even restore it. And then lastly, uh, they also need to be able to modulate the immune response. 
So that's why we investigated um, first uh, Dolosihanulum pigum AMDR11, and we could see that this bacteria showed good adherence capacity. It also showed antipathogenic and immunomodulatory effects, and in this case, this was against Staphylococcus aureus. And then lastly, we could also demonstrate that it um, has barrier restoring capacity. So more specifically, when we looked in vitro uh, using primary nasal epithelial cells from healthy individuals, we saw that uh, AMBR11 did not disturb the epithelial barrier. In vivo, we could demonstrate that um, pre-treatment with AMBR11, and this was a nasal application, it was able to prevent IL-4-induced barrier dysfunction in mice. Similar results can be shown for AMBR2. There we could also show that it had good adherence capacity, antipathogenic and immunomodulatory effects, and also was able to restore the epithelial barrier. More specifically, we saw in patients, or when we use primary nasal epithelial cells uh, from patients with CRS with nasal polyps, that AMBR11 was able to increase the transepithelial resistance. And this is a marker for epithelial integrity. And this increase was associated with an increase in two tijunction molecules, namely Claudine 1 and Claudine 4. We also evaluated the effect in vivo. And there, uh, yet again, we used our mouse model of IL-4-induced barrier dysfunction. And there we could uh, demonstrate that pretreatment with AMBR2 prevented IL-4-induced barrier dysfunction. So at this point, we do know that they, the two bacteria that we investigated have an effect on the epithelium. However, we still do not know how do they influence the epithelium. And that's why we, um, we looked at uh, the role or the interaction with the taste receptors. And these uh, receptors are seen as the gatekeepers of the airway epithelium. We have two types of taste receptors. You have the sweet and the bitter taste receptors. And these function as bacteria sensors that induce a rapid and early immune response against and countered bacterial ligands. It uh, is stated that activation of the bitter taste receptor, so the T2Rs by bitter comp compounds, results in an increase in intracellular calcium. This will eventually lead to an increased production of antimicrobial peptides, which can, of course, uh, kill the bacteria, and also an increase in uh, the production of nitric oxide, which can be direct bactericidal and can also increase ciliary Bt. However, activation of the sweet taste receptors by sweet compounds counterbalance the activation of the bitter taste receptors, which facilitates bacterial growth and a more severe inflammation. So one can state that activation of the bitter taste receptors have a more protective anti-inflammatory effect, whereas activation of the sweet taste receptors have a more pro-inflammatory disturbing effect. And indeed, um, uh, it has been shown, and this study was uh, published a couple of years ago, that Staphylococcus aureus, which is a very well-known pathogen, um, was able to activate the sweet taste receptors by producing D amino acids. And this activation resulted in the inhibition of the T2R-mediated signaling and defense in secretion. So meaning that there was a decrease in ciliary beating and also a decrease in the production of antimicrobial peptides. And this eventually led to an enhanced epithelial cell death. So based on this study, we do know that these taste receptors are um, play an important uh, role in protecting the epithelium. So that's why we asked ourselves the question, if our good bacteria, namely AMBR2 and AMBR11, can modulate these taste receptors. And indeed, uh, we were able, and these are preliminary data, we were able to show that AMBR11 and AMBR2 can modulate taste receptor-mediated innate immune response, more specifically, um, this uh, stimulation with this bacteria resulted in an increase in ciliary beat frequency and NO production in CRS. And we also saw an increased production of antimicrobial peptides also in CRS. 
So at this point, we do know that beneficial bacteria are more prevalent in the healthy upper respiratory tract versus the diseased one. We also were able to demonstrate that isolated nasal common cells show probiotic characteristics with good adherence capacity, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory activity, and that these are also able to modulate the epithelial barrier by interacting with epithelial receptors. So now we want to know if we are able to translate these fundamental findings to a clinical application. When you want to develop a novel treatment, and in this case um, with uh, containing a probioticum, it is of course important to think about how you want to administer this probioticum to your patients. And uh, this is quite challenging with probiotics because if you want to uh, use a direct nasal application, you need to follow the guidelines for live biotherapeutic products. And these guidelines are relatively new and still unclear what makes it very difficult to um, develop such uh, treatment. So that is why that often oral application is chosen as a more convenient administration route. Yet when you choose such, uh, or when you choose an oral application, it is very important to monitor the applied strains in the upper respiratory tract. More specifically, it's important to know if your bacteria is able to migrate from the oral cavity to the nasal cavity and uh, to induce a local effect. So um, that's why I, will, I want to share with you uh, two studies. And the first one, um, they used um, probiotic chewables for uh, patients with allergic uh, rhinoconjunctivitis. And this was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled tr uh, trial where they uh, used chewables containing the Lacticase bacillus rhamnosus GG, or just short LGG. During the treatment, they monitored uh, the transfer of LGG from the mouth to the nose. They also looked at the effect of LGG on nasal symptoms and also on the local cytokine production and microbiome composition. Here you have an overview of the protocol that they used. Um, so at the start of the study, they collected oral and nasal swaps to eval evaluate the microbiome composition. They also collected nasal fluid and saliva, and they asked uh, patients to monitor their symptoms by uh, daily by uh, filling out some questionnaires. The treatment was eight weeks long, where uh, the uh, chewable was applied daily. And then after eight weeks, they, um, they collected yet again oral and nasal swabs, as well as nasal fluid, saliva, and yet again, uh, the daily questionnaires. After that, there was a two weeks follow-up period uh, where they monitored the symptoms of the patients yet again using the questionnaires. And what was very interesting to see is that they were um, able to demonstrate trafficking and temporary engraftment in the upper respiratory tract of LGG after oral administration. So this means that um, thanks to the oral administration, LGG was able to migrate from the oral cavity to the nasal cavity. They did not see any alteration in microbiome composition um, after LGG treatment, and they also did not see any association between the total nasal symptom score and the microbiome composition in these patients. However, they could demonstrate or they could see that LGG treatment resulted in lower to... Um, um, total nasal symptom score in these patients. So um, now I want to show you another study where they used uh, intranasal application. As I mentioned in a couple of slides before this one, um, that um, preferentially you want to use a direct nasal application, so a local application of your treatment. And in this study, they uh, performed an open label pilot trial where they applied intranasally Lactococcus lactis in CRS patients. And they evaluated the safety of the treatment, the feasibility, and also uh, looked at po potential changes in microbiome composition. The treatment took um, 14 days and um, they performed um, yeah, or they asked again the patients to fill out questionnaires uh, 
to check, of course, uh, the effect of this treatment on their symptoms. And um, they saw that the treatment was well tolerated in these patients, and they saw an improvement of the global uh, sinus conditions as assessed by sinus symptoms, disease-specific quality of life indices, and endoscopically assessed mucosal aspect of sinuses. What was also very interesting to see is that, a, um, that there was an increased abundance of dolosigranulopigum following um, treatment with this probioticum. So you can see that um, treatment with uh, probiotics hold, of course, uh, great uh, potential. There are still some challenges, such as oral nasal administration, selecting a proper um, uh, probioticum. And, uh, but yet, it, like I said, it's quite uh, promising. So this brings me to uh, the end of my presentation. And I hope after hearing this talk that you will remember that microbiome profiling can hint at interesting taxa because this can help us in identifying niche specific common cells. That it's important to investigate probiotic characteristics of these newly identified species by looking at microbe microbe interaction. Um, if they are able to protect the epithelial barrier and to modulate immune response. Lastly, probiotics ha have a potential to treat chronic airway diseases, yet it is important to think about the application route and to, be, and to investigate um, if these probiotics result in improvement of the symptoms and or the pathophysiology uh, of, this, uh, of these disorders. So I want to thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to ask them. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for uh, a very nice introduction to the interesting field of probiotics. Um, there is um, possibilities to type questions in the Q&A uh, chat, and then we can have a discussion at uh, the end uh, of the webinar. So now I would like to invite our next uh, panelist um, is Dr. Uh, Anders Mortensen. He is a rhinologist at uh, Helsingborgs Hospital in Sweden. And last fall, he defended his PhD on probiotics in sinonasal disease. So um, I'm hoping that uh, Anders, are you able to present your um, presentation? Maybe we lost uh, Anders and uh, he might have to uh, try to log on uh, again. Um, but we have two questions uh, in the Q&A, so maybe we could try to, uh, to go through those, uh, Kathleen. Uh, there is one qu question. Please tell us the LGG migration mechanism from oral cavity to nasal cavity. Yeah, that's a that's a good good question, and I think I need to disappoint you that it's not really clear yet how they uh, migrate uh, from um, the oral cavity to uh, the nasal cavity. So we do not know this at this point. Um, they did check for like in the bloodstream if there was any uh, presence, but that was not the case. So yeah, that's probably probably there is then another way how it migrates uh, to it. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Then uh, I'm very happy to invite you, Anders Mortensen, um, oh. as the next panelist. You are a rhinologist at the Helsingborgs uh, Hospital in, uh, in Sweden. And last fall, you defended your uh, PhD on probiotics in sinonasal disease. So please, uh, Anders. Thank you. Let's see if I can find my presentation here. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> I was planning to talk about my uh, latest uh, publication, that is Upper Airway Microbiome Transplants 
for patients with chronic rhinocytosis without nasal polyps. And uh, these are my disclosures, it's only one. Uh, <clears throat> my interest in a CRS without nasal polyps has been my main focus, and it comes from a frustration of looking into a patient's nose that is filled with pus, and you take this swab and it's dripping with pus, and you still get the results back that it's no growth of any anaerobic bacteria and no growth of any clinically relevant bacteria. Uh, I felt that something was wrong and that we were asking the wrong questions. Uh, the modern um, development of uh, modern identifying, modern methods of identifying bacteria with the uh, uh, 16S uh, led to us knowing that the microbiota, uh, there is a natural microbiota in patients and healthy individuals. And this study by Abreu showed that there are differences in the numbers of taxa and the diversity detected in patients versus healthy subjects. Uh, we previously attempted to manipulate uh, the microbiome of CRS patients using honeybee bacteria, uh, but were unfortunately unsuccessful. And uh, faced with the daunting uh, task of identifying other bacteria from the nasal cavity to, to try again. We instead opted to, to try all the bacteria all at once. And this is a study by Van et al. regarding uh, fecal matter transplant for clostridium infections. And similar to what was shown in the, in the other study of CRS versus healthy patients, uh, there is a lack of uh, diversity and, the, um, and abundance of bacteria in patients with uh, Clostridium difficile that was very well mended by a fecal matter transplant. So we decided to try this as a study and recruited 25 patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with I think there might be a problem with the internet for Anders. Can you hear me, Anders? So uh, should we try to, until Anders is back, should we go on to um, uh, the next uh, question? So maybe you, Kathleen, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we have a question. Uh, is there any useful probiotics in, in the market right now? Is there any 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 probiotics that we can use for for uh, nasal or oral administration? At this point, no. For the gut, there is uh, one is known as Enterol. Uh, that one is used uh, or is based on a probioticum. Um, but for at this point, for the upper airways, I don't think so. That there is uh, already one approved as uh, as a yeah, as a drug or as a treatment option. Hmm. May I, uh, if I may, I will also ask one question. It was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, when you discussed um, or explained that bitter receptors may have um, uh, effect on the on the anti-infective uh, properties or the lining in the nose, uh, would you maybe consider that? Some sprays are more bitter than the others. Like for example, the Mista is quite disgusting. Do you think yeah. that maybe maybe that bitter taste might increase the effectiveness? Because also at the same time, it is more effective than the others. Obviously, there are antihistamines included, but also the bitter taste. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, so it's um, that's the reason why, and as you already mentioned, is that why certain medication tastes more bitter for a patient and uh, for the other ones. If you, if I may mention, um, 
uh, the, the taste receptors like CRS versus healthy controls. Um, there are um, studies reporting polymorphisms in these uh, taste receptors in patients and not in healthy individuals. So this can indeed contribute to why it, a patient responds to it or why not. So yeah, that's uh, definitely, um, yeah, definitely the case. Uh, so in general, having the treatment, internasal treatment, which is a bit bitter at the same time, Mm -hmm. might be just beneficial because this is what i'm actually explaining to patients yeah, it, yes, it is disgusting but persevere because there is some evidence that it might have an might have a benefit yeah yeah <laughs> could be yeah uh, and i know i had like uh, one bizarre experience with my patient who bought um lactobacillus used for uh not used for medical purposes mm -hmm. it's simply uh, used for the yogurts and so on mm -hmm. and he mixed it with a saline douche Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and he mm -hmm. was using that at home and yeah. it didn't help i'm not advocating obviously this but i was wondering like that uh I, I know there are probably some people around who are already uh trying to get this who are well educated uh from a patient's uh, audience uh is there any 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 maybe plan in the near future or uh, long-term future to get this uh to, to be able to because in american canada you can buy it, but because of the transport mechanism, there is still an issue. Yeah, yeah. So you you mean if it's able to have like nasal irrigation containing? Yeah, uh, is there any? Is there at the moment any, any plan? Any company is working on it? Is there? Is there any? If there are companies working on it, um, I I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But if I'm not mistaken, there are some studies in literature that um, already looked at um, using nasal irrigation uh, containing a, a probioticum. However, the problem is, and I mentioned this during my talk, is that you wash the, the nose with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm purely a scientist. But um, so when you wash it, you, of course, um, remove your bacterium as well, your probiotic as well. So that's why it's very important that when you apply it, that your bacteria can adhere to your mucosa, adhere to your epithelium and can stay there. So that is an extra challenge uh, when using nasal irrigation that, uh, yeah, when you do it, um, you need yep. to be sure that you have the correct concentration of your bacterium, of your probioticum still present in your nose. So let's hope that the one of the companies will look into that. Yeah, so we and, have mm -hmm. yeah, that's indeed. Uh, they're still, yeah, finding funding to to go to a next level, to a next clinical phase with probiot is is very, yeah, it's unfortunately still very difficult. Thank you. Do we have Venka any more questions? I don't think Anders. Here. Yes, um, I'm, I'm really sorry that uh, we missed uh, Anders, but we have uh, a few more uh, questions here. Um, are we certain that probiotics migrate from the oral to the nasal cavity? And if so, do we know what percentage? You, and you have any idea about that, Kathleen? So indeed, um, it's uh, with the study that I've showed, and um, there you can, uh, could uh, nicely see, I don't know if I need to show my graph again, but there you could uh, see that there is an increase of LGG present. So mm -hmm. they use specific primers um, towards um, LGG uh, to validate this. So yes, indeed, there is migration from um, the oral cavity to the, the nasal cavity. Yes. Then we have another question here. Do I understand correctly that oral probiotics are practically pills that patients keep in oral cav cavity and not swallow? Um, so yeah, in, in this case, they used uh, chewables. So indeed that it's more in a, in a pill form, uh, yeah. if I may say it like that. Um, but yeah, here, um, and it's, it's the same for uh, nasal application is that you need to be certain that the concentration of your probioticum in your product um, remains stable mm. and that, that you can nowadays you you buy medication and you can keep it for a couple of months a year years <laughs> even so this is still um, yeah something that is under investigation that uh, to see if how long does those probiotics um, stay stable but the good thing is with oral administration is that um, there are already 
um, think about yogurts, um, already more, um, um, how can I say it, more options to develop it into, uh, yeah, a, a, a pill uh, compared to uh, nasal sprays. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen. No so uh, on this, we've just had a, a small break here and we've discussed uh, a lot of yeah. um, Kathleen's um, interesting findings. So you can just start your presentation again. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so here we go. I'm sharing it. And... Yeah. Oh. Yeah, looks nice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I was talking about uh, recruiting um, uh, participants for our study. Uh, and so we had gone over the patients and the donors. Uh, the donors were median age of 50. There were also seven men and 18 women. They had no history of chronic rhinus endocytis and no history of upper airway disease other than the common cold for the last two years. Uh, when, when doing uh, all matter transplants, there are two types of risks. Uh, the first is a very real and well-documented risk of infection. Uh, this has been seen very much in fecal matter transplants and sometimes even with lethal outcome. The second type is hypothetical risk uh, that comes from transplanting traits that has been seen in mice. For example, you are afraid of transplanting with diabetes or asthma or, or in mice simply you have seen that by transplanting a fecal matter, you can develop thin mice out of fat mice and vice versa. Uh, the suggested way of handling both these risks is through a thorough, thorough screening process. And here are the diseases that we screened for, uh, for herpes, CMV and EBV, and also varicella. The donor was accepted if the patient had a corresponding uh, immunological uh, traits. Uh, we also looked at asthma and allergy and the screen for those so that we didn't transplant any of those. Here is a simplified version of the transplant study flowchart. Uh, at visit zero, we screened the patients for pathogens. Then we started by giving the patient 13 days of antibiotics. This is the same as it's done in uh, fecal matter transplants. Uh, the ecological principles dictate that there are two favorable conditions for transplanting microbiome. The first is pristine condition, uh, previously uninhabited biome. And the second is post-disturbance, or it's called succession. So by disturbing the patients uh, uh, with the existing microbiome, we sort of uh, made it very favorable for the, for the donor transplant to attach. This was followed by five consecutive days of uh, transplant procedure and uh, finally two days of follow-up. Transplant procedure was done using a nasaline uh, device uh, filled with 50 milliliters of saline that was instilled into the nasal cavity. Um, the patient and the donor was asked to hold the saline into the, in the nose for five minutes and uh, the donor then blew them into a kidney dish and we collected this and split it into two halves and had added further saline so it would uh, be enough for the patient's two sides. Uh, here is a short video of me. Uh,
Fascinating stuff. Um, the patient was also asked to uh, retract the saline back into the syringe and then quickly expel it into the nose for maximum reach. Uh, and the results of the study, the main outcome measure was SNOT-22. Uh, 16 out of 22 patients reported uh, MCID improvement, uh, improvement of SNOT-22 greater than MCID. And for the rhinologic domain, 21 out of 22 patients reported improvement greater than MCID. Uh, MCID is the minimum clinical important difference. Non-reported worsening symptoms greater than MCID. We also looked at some inflammatory markers in the nasal lavages. Uh, for uh, nasal lavages, Ramtis has been suggested as a good way to differentiate between patients within the healthy donors and patients with chronic sinusitis. And looking at Ramtis and comparing patients as visit one to donors at visit one, you see a clear difference uh, indicating that at least the patients uh, were the right type of patients. Uh, the other uh, inflammatory markers are really hard to interpret. Uh, IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory marker, and it decreased during for the patients during the uh, during this trial, uh, possibly indicating a, a healthier nose. For some reason, the interferon gamma kept rising for the patients throughout the study, and, and I have no further explanation for that. Looking at the microbiota, uh, the identified species were uh, found in almost all patient groups and also at the donors. So most of the microbiota was shared among all patients and donors. Uh, we also saw that comparing the donors to the patients at visit one, there was no real uh, difference in neither abundance nor diversity. This was not what we had expected initially, but it is in line with newer and bigger studies uh, showing that the, the diversity seen in the initial study is no longer uh, really thought to be existing. We saw that after the antibiotic treatment, both the abundance and the diversity rose significantly for the, for the patients. This is also unsurprising since those PCR method doesn't differentiate between living and dead bacteria. However, at three months post-transplant procedure, there was still a significant rise in both abundance and diversity, possibly indicating the establishment of a new microbiome. When we compared the patients who improved to the patients who did not improve during the study, there was a tendency that the patients who experienced improvement had a lower abundance and lower diversity of their microbiomes at the initiation of the study. <clears throat> Our conclusions from this study is that nasal microbiome transplants obtained for healthy individuals and administered as nasal lavages to patients with chronic rhinitis without nasal polyps are feasible. The patients reported significant and lasting reduction of symptoms. And these findings were associated with a lasting increase in abundance and diversity of the cyanonasal microbiome. For future perspectives, uh, numerous studies have highlighted the importance of the microbiome in the development of the immune function and for maintaining human health. Previous views of the commensal microbiota as passive passengers are being replaced by a more holistic view of humans and their microbiota affecting each other and indicating that the view of a functional unit of host and microbiota, what's called a holobiont, best describes the situation. Further, the list of health problems with where a potential role of the microbiome is indicated is ever growing and is now encompassing cancer as well as neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, the, our expanding knowledge of the microbiome is tightly associated with technological advances. 
an ongoing development of new instruments and technologies for both better, better resolution and new perspectives to study the microbiome. Still, there is a need for old fashioned experimental studies as a complement to observational studies to further our understanding of the complex interplay between host and microbiota, and hopefully to utilize this understanding for new and better treatment options. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anders, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, we have a few questions in the Q&A chat, so I hope that you and Kathleen might uh, join your uh, expertise together and try to answer uh, the questions. So um, we have um, uh, a question. Um, would nasal microbiome transplants also be feasible in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with the nasal polyps? Uh, there, there is nothing indicated that it that would it wouldn't be feasible to do. We're also planning a, a new study, a new placebo-controlled and bigger study, where we plan to include also patients with nasal polyps. So uh, I could say that it, it will be feasible to do it. There is nothing uh, talking against that. Uh, However, if it's effective or not, I hope to be able to answer that question in a couple of years' time. There's also um, a question here. Could you explain one more time why you give antibiotics before the study? Uh, you mean before the transplant procedure? Uh, yeah. It's to uh, all the patients, although uh, it's indicated that the microbiome of the patients is unstable. But even as an unstable microbiome, there is some form of stability uh, in this microbiome. And to make the patients more receptible for the transplant, it's ideal to disrupt this form of stability, like you're plowing a field before you're seeding it. Uh, so it's the same with the microbiome. You give antibiotics to disrupt uh, the existing microbiome to be able to see the new one. And there's also a question about uh, after what time um, was the SNOT22 questionnaire given and what was the follow-up time of your patients in that study? Yeah, the last, uh, the last SNOT22 questionnaire was given three months after the uh, transplant procedure, and that was the, the end of the study and the last time point of follow up. Mm. Um, what about patients with previous uh, endoscopic sinus surgery? Would it be more um, uh, useful to give them uh, probiotics because it's more easily accessible to, to the sinuses? Right, quite a hypothetical question. Um, yeah, I, I think there is some yeah, I think on the problem. Again. Yeah. Um, I will try to to answer this question. So, um, the the thing. So I I showed a study where they did the intranasal administration, and this was in CRS patients, and there they uh, did it as well in CRS with nasal polyps first, or they made a comparison between CRS with nasal polyps and CRS sin nasal polyp patients. And there they saw in the with nasal polyp patients that um, the treatment uh, resulted in a, such the increased presence of dolosigranulum pigrum. This, so this maybe answers a bit to the previous uh, question. And then um, yet again, I think, um, the ideally it should be not influenced by if the patients already had a previous FES or not. Because um we we saw in our comparison study that um yeah that well we did saw that there was a, a small association between the history of FES and um the microbiome composition in our patients. So um, meaning that those that had already a previous FES had slightly different 
uh, mac a slightly different microbiome composition compared to those that underwent a FES for the first time. So it could be due to that it became more accessible that this can have a positive effect. But I think in an ideal state, you would you would just want to treat your patient with or without uh, surgery. But of course, this is maybe a, a, the opinion of a scientist and not a medical doctor. <laughs> But is there, um, as a clinician, it's uh, you're always looking for a good ways to differentiate uh, a healthy mucosa from a sick mucosa. Is is uh, is there any way to differentiate between a healthy and a diseased microbiome in a, in a very <laughs> clinical, easy, easy going way? That's a very good question, uh, because up till now, it's actually not really know what is a healthy microbiome. Because um, if I may give an example is uh, Staphylococcus aureus. We do know that it's present in our healthy individuals. Mm. Patients that do not have allergic rhinitis nor CRS have Stav aureus. But at some point, this because Stavaris is also a common cell bacteria, at one point it becomes pathogenic. Mm. What is the reason? Why did it became, uh, become pathogenic? And that is not known. So, and that's why we, we do not know what is a healthy microbiome. What we can use as to define it, I think, is by looking at those beneficial bacteria. So looking at those lactic acid bacteria, that I mentioned during my presentation to see, do we see a decrease in those? Yes or no? And maybe based on that, we can define this is more a diseased microbiome versus a healthy one. But even there, how much needs to, does it need to be decreased to talk about a diseased one? So it's still up in the air. It's still a discussion. So yeah, that's why it's a very good question. <laughs> If I, if I may, I would ask uh, a question that's from the audience. Uh, this is, again, the same uh, type of question where uh, we are all wondering whether there are any uh, probiotics that uh, can be potentially used and that are out there without uh, specifics for the medical use. Like uh, Donata is asking, what about uh, Reno, Germina, Sachet Composition, Streptococcus salivarius and Streptococcus oralis? It's an anti-caking agent. Another question was, uh, what about fluid probiotics? And so just about the fluid uh, probiotics, um, do they refer to the application or how it needs to be applied? So or There are existing fluid uh, probiotics that um, are drinkable and are not used, meant to be for medical use. And I think that's the, what the, the question was meant to be. The mm -hmm. other one that's a separate one about the Reno Germina. Yeah. Uh, if that potentially can be considered, if you have got any experience, it is anti caking agent. Mm -hmm. I, me personally, I don't have any experience with with those. Um, but yeah, if I, if I would, I would, yeah, recommend to first uh, do some bench work and to see in in vivo, in vitro, um, if it uh, has those probiotic characteristics. And if yes, then see if we can um, formulate it and apply it to, to patients. But of course, um, there is also important is to see, because um, yeah, you, you want to apply a probioticum to the airway. So it needs to be able to adapt to the environment in the airways. You have your mucociliary clearance, you have the, the colder temperature, uh, you have your aerobic uh, condition. So it could be that they that they survive there, but this is something that first needs to be proven before you can, um, yeah, talk about uh, a treatment. Uh, there is another question, just uh, recently posted. Um, if the tra first transplant is not effective, do you proceed to another transplant, and in which time frame from the first one? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, we only tried once. The The study was uh, was designed like that. We do one transplant procedure over five days, and then we follow them for three months and see what happens. 
So it was more of a pilot study to see, is this a feasible way to do it? Uh, and are there any indication that it will be effective to decide whether we should go ahead with another bigger trial? So the results are promising, but it's hard to draw any real conclusions from it. We have another question here. Um, uh, it says, good evening and thanks for the presentation. Can we use these microbiotics as on the absorbable nasal package or tampoon? you have any experience using it uh, after uh, sinonasal surgery? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, I have not used any probiotics uh, as an adjunct to other uh, surgery or any other clinical practice. Uh, all my use of probiotics and the transplants are purely uh, scientific, so it, they are all done in a scientific context. Mm -hmm. I think there are um, some murine models or experiments performed uh, where they look at the effect of nasal tampons containing bacteria on on immune response. And uh, I don't know them by heart, but if I'm not mistaken, I think it was relatively recently that there is one pu published where they um, try to develop a CRS mouse model where they added uh, tampons to the nose of the mice uh, containing certain bacteria to see if they can uh, induce um, a CRS-like uh, endotype. So maybe there we can already find some answers. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I would like to close this webinar uh, by thanking uh, Anders and Kathleen for fantastic talks. And I would also like to thank the European uh, Rhinologic Society for the amazing support and also thank Olympus for sponsoring the webinar series. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time. So um, have a nice uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.